most of those I got it. Uh, most of those uh, of you know this guy here, which is Louis Nell, who said in his noble lecture in 1970 that antiferromagnets are interesting but useless. And today I want to actually convince you that they're indeed extremely interesting, but maybe they are more useful than Louis Nell thought at the time. So why are they potentially useful? Now, if you compare a ferromagnet and an antiferromagnet, in a ferromagnet, you actually store the information in the direction of the magnetic moment, which can be pointing, say, to the right or to the left. And to the right is a bit logic one, and to the left is a logic zero. Now, the disadvantage of this approach is that this bit here, the magnetic moment, generates a stray field that couples to the neighboring bit. And that means that these two bits here that have different neighbors, the top bit has neighbors pointing in the same direction, and the bottom bit has neighbors pointing in the opposite direction, feel a different energy landscape due to the different interactions. And therefore, the switching of these two bits will be different, which makes this not very robust. And also, if you make the spacing between these two bits very small, they will actually not be able to stay stable, but they will always form a parallel arrangement so that you cannot stabilize the zero and the one, and this limits your memory density. Now, this is fundamentally different in antiferromagnets. There you have, in the simplest case, two sublattices with opposite magnetization, and so they perfectly compensate the magnetic moments, leading to zero net stray field. So this means that you have very high bit packing density. You can bring these bits very close to each other. But also, typically, we cannot distinguish between the two sublattices pointing right and left or left and right, so that you store the information not in a 180 degree different orientation, as shown here, but in a 90 degree different orientation. And this orientation of the two sublattices, we call the Niel vector, which formally is simply the difference between the two sublattices. So here for bit zero, the Niel vector is pointing in the horizontal direction. And for bit one, the Niel vector is pointing in the vertical direction. And this then allows to potentially pack more than 100 times more uh, bits into the same vol volume, which makes it, of course, very exciting. So what else is different? Now, in ferromagnets, you have typically a large magnetic susceptibility, i.e. when you apply a field, the magnetization will react. And typically, this is a susceptibility of the order of a 1,000. Now, in antiferromagnets, because there's no net moment, the susceptibility is five orders of magnitude smaller, so very little reaction to antiferromagnets. And so why is that? Well, it's because the strongest interaction we have in antiferromagnets is the anti-parallel coupling between two spins in neighboring sublattices. So that's the inter-sublattice coupling, which is of the order of 1,000 Tesla, and sets the transfer susceptibility. So the next biggest interaction is the coupling between spins of the same sublattice, which is ferromagnetic, and that's of the order of 100 Tesla or so, and together these set the nail temperature. Now, what is important is that we can never in the lab reach these energy scales. So we cannot apply a thousand Tesla in the lab. However, there is one energy scale which we can reach, and that is the reorientation of the two sublattices from this to that direction. So the nail vector from pointing from this direction to that direction, turning by 90 degrees. And that is actually set by the anisotropy energy. And the anisotropy can be small, making this reorientation accessible in the order of a few Tesla. Now, one of the most important consequences of this very strong anti-parallel coupling of the two sublattices is the so-called exchange enhancement of the dynamics. So the eigenfrequencies are typically in a ferromagnet in the gigahertz scale, fMR, and in antiferromagnets, they're two to three orders of magnitude higher in the terahertz regime. And now this is important because the eigenfrequencies fundamentally set the maximum switching speed. And that means we can potentially switch an antiferromagnet a thousand times faster than a ferromagnet. And if you're interested, I'm sure there will be more on terahertz and dynamics in the talk by Romain, who is going to speak after me. So I'm going to skip most of the dynamics. Uh, and I should just point out, there actually have also been experiments on that. 
Now, another thing that I was not so aware of before I started the work is that there are not so many ferromagnets, but there are lots of antiferromagnets. And the question is why? Well, the reason that there are so many antiferromagnets is that you can have a lot of different antiferromagnetic couplings. So you can have a layered antiferromagnet where in one layer all the spins are pointing up, in the next layer all the spins are pointing down and so on. Or you can have within a layer spin up and spin down and it's the same across all layers. Or you can have within a layer spin up and spin down and then it's the reverse orientation, the next layer and so on. And these types are actually all realized in nature, such as here nickel oxide, which is a layered antiferromagnet, where in the one on one planes all the spins are pointing up, in the next one on one plane the spins are pointing down, and so on. Or manganese to gold, where we actually find one layer spin up, one layer spin down, one layer spin up, one layer spin down, and so on. And that is only for collinear antiferromagnets. If we now also go to more complex ordering, which is non-collinear coplanar, then we see that the spins point in all kinds of directions, but on average, the net magnetization of one plaquette is zero. And it gets even more complex if you have non-collinear, non-coplanar antiferromagnetism, where you see spins are pointing in the plane, but also towards you and away from you. So there are a lot of different complex possibilities to have zero net magnetic moment, but still have magnetic order. And that means there are many, many different types of antiferromagnets available. Another property that I was not so aware of before I started working on this is that the magnetoelastic coupling in ferromagnets is often much weaker than in antiferromagnets. And this bodes well for using antiferromagnets for low power uh, operation because you can use low power electric field that generates strain to manipulate the magnetic, magnetic moments. Now, the exchange for ferromagnets typically is simple. Heisenberg exchange, all the spins parallel. And for antiferromagnets, anti it's often rather complex, as you saw before, with all the different exchange integrals leading to this non-collinear, non-coplanar uh, magnetic ordering. And while well, useful, obviously, ferromagnets are useful. Uh, they're useful in sensors and in memory because they're easy to measure and easy to control. However, in antiferromagnets, they are actually used at the moment only as passive elements in exchange bias of hard drive heads, for instance. And that is because they're hard to measure and hard to control. And so antiferromagnets are definitely interesting and possibly useful even as active elements if we can actually measure and control them. Now, it might be early morning for everyone, so um, if you want to doze off, please give me one more slide, uh, which is the key take-home message. And this is ferromagnets are manipulated by Ørsted field, and that's 19th century physics. Antiferromagnets can be manipulated by staggered nail spin orbitals, which is 21st century physics. So this is super exciting. This is super boring. That's the take-home message. And now comes the actual science. All right, so if we want to make an antiferromagnet useful, we need to be able to read out the state of its spin orientation, i.e. the nil vector orientation. So let's start. Why is this not so, why is this important? Now, for instance, in nickel oxide, where I said we have the spins in the 111 plane, there are, of course, different orientations in the 111 plane. And that is because there are four different 111 planes. And within each of these 111 planes, you can actually have three orientations. So overall, there are 12 possible orientations for the nail vector for the direction of the two sublattices. So, how can we detect this? Fortunately, there's a very powerful technique out there, which is X-ray magnetic linear dichroism, which was actually invented even before x-ray magnetic circular dichroism in these papers here. And this allows for the identification of the nail vector orientation. What we do is we hit our sample with a polarized, linearly polarized x-ray beam. And then the absorption of our x-rays will be different on whether the polarization, which is horizontal or vertical, is parallel or perpendicular to the nail vector, which you see here, the red is a little bit lower than the black signal. And if you plot the difference, you can see here a clear difference. And so this absorption is depending on the relative orientation of the polarization of the X-rays and the nail vector. 
So now what we can do is we can rotate the polarization of our X-rays and we can rotate the sample. And by that, we get different contrasts where we see, for instance, here, three different domains with different orientations of the nail vector. And now by rotating all these different orientations, we can actually fit the data and obtain the absolute directions of the nail vector in 3D in these domains. And we find that actually they're not in the 111 plane um, as predicted or as known for the bulk, but in thin film nickel oxide, they're actually in the 5519 orientations due to strain of the thin film nickel oxide grown on MGO. Now, if you're interested, there's more details in these papers here. So XMLD is really, really useful. However, when you talk to a company, they're not going to put a synchrotron into their CMOS device. So companies want electrical readout. So let's check if we can get electrical readout. So it turns out there's a mechanism which is spin hole magnetoresistance, or in short, SMR. Now, this was first uh, developed for ferromagnets, ferry magnets in this paper here, and later by Aurelion, which we heard yesterday, on for antiferromagnets. And it's simply an antiferromagnet with some platinum wire on top. And then we have current flowing in the platinum wire, which generates a spin accumulation at the interface to our antiferromagnet. And now these spins here can enter the antiferromagnet if the nail vector has an angle with the orientation of the spins. If the nail vector is perfectly parallel to the spins, then the spin current is fully reflected and by the inverse spin hall effect <clears throat> generates a charge current in the platinum wire and that changes the measured resistance. So effectively, we are measuring a resistance where there's a contribution that is pr proportional to the dot product between the nail vector and the spin squared. Now, this was first observed in these two papers here, and then later also by us, where we put on top of nickel oxide platinum, and then we drive a current through the platinum, and then we ori reorient the nickel oxide in different orientations and measure the resistance of the platinum. And as expected, we get this cosine squared dependence, so this dot product between L and S squared, and that is what we expect from the SMR. Now, this is really great. If you're interested, here's the paper. However, the effect is rather modest. Actually, these 14 milliohm correspond to a resistance change of 10 to the minus 5. So a company says, forget that. We want 100% resistance change, not 10 to minus 5. So the next approach was to simply use the magnetoresistance effect in conducting antiferromagnets, such as manganese to gold. Here again is the domain structure where we see as grown we have gray domains where the nail vector is pointing up down, and we have black domains where the nail vector is pointing right left. And we can even make the sample more monodomain where it's mostly nail vector pointing up down. So now we run a current through this material, and then we find if the current is running perpendicular to the nail vector, perpendicular to the two sublattice orientations, then the resistance is high. And if the current is running parallel to the nail vector, parallel to the two sublattice magnetization, the resistance is low. However, still the effect is rather modest, 0.15%. And we did it also in the optical range where in optical dichroism we find 0.6%. So again, we think that's great, but companies said, forget that. We don't want 0.1, 0.6%, we want 100%. So what can we do? Now it turns out what we can do is we can couple our manganese to gold with a ferromagnet on top. And we were surprised to see that we actually get extremely strong coupling between the permalloy and the manganese to gold. And we find that actually the domain structure of the permalloy does not look like the domain structure of normal permalloy, but rather looks like a domain structure of manganese to gold. And then if you do XMLD in the manganese to gold and in the permalloy, we see there is perfect registry, meaning that the permalloy completely mirrors the orientation of the domains in the manganese to gold. Now, this is great, but unexpected, because typically we know that the coupling between an antiferromagnet and a ferromagnet at the interface is a residual effect of uncompensated spins, because you have many terraces and step edges that lead to random coupling. So why is the coupling here so strong? 
It turns out that if you optimize the growth of the manganese to gold, then the layers of the manganese to gold always finish with a gold atom. And if you look here, um, below the gold atom, we have a red manganese atom with the spins pointing to the right. And below this gold atom, we also have spins pointing to the right. So this means at the interface to the permaloy, we always have the same orientation of the uh, antiferromagnetic sublattice, namely always the red sublattice is at the interface. And that means that you have a fully uncompensated interface where you can have coupling that is as strong as for a ferromagnet potentially. So tens of Tesla of coupling. So this has two important consequences. The first one is we can use the ferromagnet to read out the antiferromagnet. So we can put on top of the ferromagnet cobalt ion boron an MGO barrier and then have 100% TMR to read out the antiferromagnetic spin structure by putting a thin layer of a ferromagnet on top of the thick antiferromagnet. So that's one of the things. The other thing which I find even more exciting is that fundamentally the ultra fast dynamics of the manganese to gold can be imprinted into the ferromagnet. So you can have dynamics of the ferromagnet, which is much faster than typical. And here's some new result that we recently put on archive where we actually measured the dynamics of permaloy on manganese to gold. And we find that we have much higher spin dynamics in the permalloy than in the manganese to gold, as shown here. There are even two modes. If you're interested, we can, can look at the paper here or ask me later. But in particular, at zero applied field, where you get in pure permalloy one or two gigahertz, we actually get up to 100 gigahertz of spin dynamics in the permalloy. So that is super exciting, where it allows us to do, have dynamics in the permalloy, which is significantly faster than anything you can do with pure permalloy alone, while still retaining the advantages of a ferromagnet, namely that you can get 100% TMR. So if you're interested, have a look at this paper. If you're the referee, please be kind. And now finally, how can we read out antiferromagnetic 2D materials? 2D materials are super exciting because in a 2D material such as chromium trichloride, you can have a monolayer, which is a ferromagnet, a bilayer, which is an antiferromagnet, a trilayer, which is a ferromagnet. And we chose chromium thiophosphate, where again, a monolayer is a ferromagnet, a bilayer is an antiferromagnet, and then we did um, uh, spin hole magneto resistance measurements uh, to detect, for instance, a spin flop, which can be easily done here, where you can read out the spin flop of a flake. So if you're interested, here is the paper. All right, so this is the first part of my talk. So I've shown you that you can do electrical readout of antiferromagnets. Uh, SMR is working, but low. And as tropic major resistance is a bit higher, but still not a large effect. You can do direct imaging by XMLD, but in particular, you can do exchange bias, antiferromagnetic ferromagnetic coupling, large TMR, and super fast dynamics. There are also other mechanisms that I don't have time to go into. If you're interested, have a look at these slides. So at these papers, and by the way, I'm very happy to share my slides. You don't need to copy this. Just send me an email, and I'll send you the slides. Now the second part is we need to write. How can we set the antiferromagnetic order in our sample? So magnetic fields are not a good idea because magnetic fields typically don't couple well to antiferromagnets because the two sublattices are very strongly coupled antiferromagnetically. So when you apply a field, you get only a tiny canting. This is highly exaggerated. Typically, the canting is millirad. However, still, if you change the magnetic field direction by 90 degrees, you also will change the orientation of this small canted moment. And so the two sublattices will rotate by 90 degrees perpendicular to each other when you change the orientation of the applied field by 90 degrees as well. There's also another effect. If you have very low coupling, then you can even get a spin flip, which in some 2D materials we have observed, but we are not actually looking at this. It's just for the, sakeness, um, for the sake of completeness. 
Okay, so how can we show that we can reorient the antiferromagnetic nail order? Well, we can do XMLD spectroscopy. And then when we apply a strong field in this direction, we get first a dip and then a peak. And then we reorient the field in this direction. Then we get first a peak and then a dip. And this means we have reoriented our nail vector. But the field that we had to apply here in manganese to gold was 50 Tesla. And 50 Tesla is not something that any company is going to put into their CMOS device. So then how about strain? I told you that these materials have strong magnetoelastic coupling. So by applying a bit of strain, you should be able to reorient the nail vector. And so we've built a mechanical straining device where this looks like a medieval torture device where you put your sample on the center bar, you squeeze it by these two screws, you tighten the screws until either the sample confesses or dies. Often it dies first, but sometimes it confesses. So what happens is that for the unstrained sample, we have the same amount of domains in this orientation and this orientation, so no big XMLD signal. And once we have strained the sample, just using an elongation of 0.1%, you get a clear peak and then a dip, showing that we've reoriented the nail vector in the vert uh, vertical direction. So this works. But of course, no company would ever put a medieval torture device, mechanical strain device into their CMOS. So you need electrical generation of strain. So to do that, we teamed up with a group of Greg Carmen at UCLA, where we put nickel oxide on top of PMNPT. PMNPT is a piezoelectric material. Then when you apply a voltage between here and here, this generates a strain profile shown here in the simulation. And that then allows you to reorient the nail vector by applying strain. So if you're interested, here's the paper. Um, however, companies don't like PMNPT. And so we still need to think about something better. When we did this type of work, what we found is that there can also be strain due to patterning. So when you have nickel oxide patterned into small devices, then you get a little bit of strain relaxation at the edges. And that actually leads to domain formation in such a bar as shown here. So here we have a rectangle pattern nickel oxide. And then we see that there is some domain structure forming that looks very much like the domain structure in a ferromagnet. But in ferromagnets, the shape anisotropy that leads to domain structures is due to stray fields. And here we have no stray fields. So it cannot be stray fields. So what is the origin? Now, it turns out that this was investigated in a lot of detail by Helen Gomonai theoretically, where if you pattern such a device, you get a strain relaxation that at these corners here, actually the unit cell deforms as shown here, and that's the inner corner. Whereas at the outer corner, you get the opposite deformation of the unit cell. And that means there's a rotation of the strain. So you get opposite strain at this corner and this corner, this corner, and this corner. And this is what you see. This corner on the inside is white, the outside is black. Here, the corner on the inside is black, the outside is white, and so on. So this is some kind of shape anisotropy for antiferromagnets due to strain relaxations at the edges. And you can actually model this, and then you get very nice agreement between the theoretically modeled domain structure and the experimentally found domains. And the nice thing is that we can, by varying the shape of our device, we can set the domain structure. And this can be perfectly reproduced by these strain simulations done by Hank Gomolai and as shown in this paper. Now that's great, we can set the domain structure, but of course that's a permanent static thing. We cannot change the domain structure once we've done the patterning. So how can we switch? Well, the best thing to switch is current. Companies love currents. We talk to SP Microelectronics or Thales or whatever, they love to switch with current because that's already well established with spin transfer torques. And ferromagnets, this, no, this works very well. You see here, if you have a ferromagnet and you inject a spin polarized current, then the spin polarized current will transfer its spin angular momentum on the ferromagnet. And so the ferromagnetic moments will rotate clockwise whereas the spin of the spin current will rotate counterclockwise due to angular momentum conservation. 
So in ferromagnets, this works well, but in antiferromagnets, this is less clear because if you inject a spin polarized current, it wants to rotate one sublattice clockwise and the other sublattice counterclockwise. And this means that these two sublattices want to rotate differently, but because they're very strongly antiparallel coupled, they cannot rotate. So it should not work. However, there was a prediction that there are some materials where the torque on the two sublattices can be in opposite directions, so or in the, in the same direction, so that the two sublattices actually rotate coherently. So let me explain you how. Now there are materials such as manganese to gold or copper manganese arsenide, where the two sublattices are inequivalent. Here you see the manganese A sublattice, single manganese atom. If it looks up, it sees gold. If it looks down, it sees four manganese B side spins. If the manganese B side single manganese atom, if it looks down, it sees gold. And if it looks up, it sees four manganese A side atoms. And so this means these two spins here have different local surroundings and therefore the torque acting on them can be that they actually rotate together coherently. And the same holds for copper manganese arsenide and there's a number of papers that have investigated this. So you can imagine that this is like having two sublattices where the current generates a little magnetic field that acts on the sublattice here in this direction and the sublattice here in the opposite direction. As if you had here a clock which has a coil which has a clockwise uh, rotation, or uh, uh, and here you have a coil which is wound in a counterclockwise fashion, generating two opposite local fields. So this was predicted for manganese to gold by Jakub Selezny and then first observed by uh, Pete Radley in copper manganese arsenide. And then we looked at it in manganese to gold where you expect that the two sublattices rotate coherently together when we inject a current. So to probe this, we went to a cross where we inject the current either in this direction, then we expect the two sublattices to reorient this way. And if we inject the current this way, we expect the two sublattices to reorient this way. So now we see that when we inject a current in a real manganese to gold device along the um, one one bar zero direction, then the resistance of a planar Hall effect or AMR goes down. And if we inject the current pulse in the perpendicular one one zero direction, the resistance goes up. So we can really switch up and down, up and down. So we can really reorient the nail vector uh, in the direction this way or that way by applying perpendicular current pulses. So what is important here, we are talking about current pulses flowing in perpendicular direction. And we directly imaged this very recently. So there's a paper which just got accepted in Nature Communications where we actually put the current this way and you see everything where the current was flowing turned black. And then we change the current orientation in the horizontal direction. And then the current uh, rotates the nail vector and everything turns white. And then you put again the current pulse in the vertical direction, it turns black and then white and so on. So this can be done very nicely. And we really have like two stable orientations that are stable over months and that we can switch in between. So this really like for memory is what we want. Now, <clears throat> To unambiguously identify the switching mechanism, we also looked at the changing of the antiferromagnet domain structure due to current pulses with different polarity. Note that effectively, if you have opposite polarity, the net switching should be the same, but you can get domain wall motion. And that's what we see here. See this part here, when we inject the current this way, it turns white. And when we inject the current the opposite direction, it turns black again, and it turns white again, and so on. So this allows us to show that at least you have some domain wall motion that is a direct signature of spin orbit torques, because if there are other effects such as heating, it should never depend on the polarity of the injected current. So this, if you're interested, is some new results in this paper, hopefully in nature, well, in nature communication sometime soon, hopefully soon. <laughs> okay.
Now, this is great. It works. We have one material or two materials, manganese to gold, a copper manganese arsenide, where we can switch due to spin orbitorks. But of course, it would be even better if we had a mechanism to switch many other antiferromagnets, which don't have the special symmetry breaking where the two sublattices are inequivalent. For most antiferromagnets, the two sublattices are equivalent, like nickel oxide, cobalt oxide, where this mechanism will not work. However, there's another mechanism where if you have such an antiferromagnet with a domain wall and you inject current through the platinum layer, then the spin polarization generated at the interface will actually move the domain wall. This was predicted in this paper by Kim Jin Lee's group and also by Han Gumanai and Hiro Sinova. But the problem is, <clears throat> the, and, and, and the advantage is that the domain wall velocity in these antiferromagnets is not limited by the Walker breakdown as in ferromagnets. In ferromagnets, typically, we actually have a Walker breakdown that limits the speed of the domain wall to a few hundred meters per second, whereas in antiferromagnets, it's only limited by the speed of light or the speed of magnons in this case, which can be uh, kilometers per second. So one to two orders of magnitude faster domain wall motion in antiferromagnets than in ferromagnets. But there is still a caveat, and that is the orientation of the domain wall. So this here, whether the domain wall actually is rotating clockwise or counterclockwise is random if there is no symmetry breaking that leads to chiral spin structures. And that would mean that half of the domain walls will move right, half of the domain walls will move left, and that would actually lead to no effective switching. So there's another mechanism which was put forward in this paper here by Han Gomonai, which is the ponder motive force, which actually reorients the two sub the, the, the two sublattices in our orientation that is perpendicular to the polarization of the spins generated by the spin hall effect. And that can lead to a net switching. So now we wanted to check this experimentally. Actually, the first experiment that I know of where people tried that uh, to put nickel oxide platinum was uh, Takamoriyama in this paper here. And we then later put also different nickel oxide thicknesses with different platinum in such a hall cross. And then we inject current pulses in two perpendicular directions. You see here at the center of the hall cross, the current is flowing this way. And here at the center of the hall cross, the current is flowing that way. So 90 degree different reorientation. So you expect 90 degree different switching of the uh, nail vector. Now, the good news is, Lots, are, lots is happening when we inject currents. It looks very messy. The bad news is it's not easy to understand. So let me walk you through this slowly. So now if you have low current density, nothing, nothing is switching. If we now inject a little more current, five injections in this direction, you see the first current pulse switches something and then not much happens anymore. And then a perpendicular current will actually switch it back. And then again, a perpendicular current switches this way and this way. So this is a little bit what you expect from switching of the nail vector. First current pulse switches it, then it stays opposite or perpendicular current pulse switches it back. So that's fine. But now if we inject even more, then we see the first current pulse leads to a positive sign. And then the next current pulse with the same orientation leads to the opposite behavior. So this cannot be, you cannot have a, spin orbit torque induced switching where the first current pulse rotates it one way and the next current pulse with the same polarity switches it in a different direction. So what is happening here? So to figure that out, I said, okay, let's do imaging. I like imaging because imaging tells you what is really going on. So intermediate current densities give you even more complex behavior. So let's do imaging. Here we have our cross where we inject a single current pulse and bam, everywhere where the current has flown, the nail vector has switched. And now we inject a perpendicular current pulse and bam, it switches back. So clearly now we have magnetic switching. But then if this is magnetic switching, what is this different behavior happening with the current uh, generating opposite um, electrical signals? And to check that, we actually went to cobalt oxide because cobalt oxide has a nail temperature around room temperature so we can measure easily in the magnetically ordered phase and the disordered phase. So let's first start at low temperature where we have a magnetically ordered phase. Then again, the blue dots here show low current density, no switching. 
than the orange and the green show higher current density and we see clearly it switches up and down as we expect. And the very high current density, we get this weird triangular behavior here that we don't understand. And now we go to uh, a temperature above the nail temperature where there's no magnetic order. And we see low current density, nothing happening. Intermediate current density, nothing happening. But high current density, we still see this triangular switching. And so this means there's nothing magnetic because we are above the nail temperature. This cannot be a magnetic effect. And it turns out it actually it's electromigration of the platinum due to this very high current density. And this was also seen in these nice papers here. Okay, so now we know what electrical switching can be detected and result in what magnetic switch. So to understand now this real magnetic switching that we did by imaging, we wanted to check what is the origin. Is it really spin orbit torque? And then what we did is we first made two different samples where in one sample, we flow the current from left to right. And in one sample, we flow the current in this flower shape here, which at the center has the same current orientation for both. So the center, the current is just flowing from left to right. So if it's spin orbit torque, it should yield the same switching, but it doesn't. So we see here at the center, it has switched from black to white, and here at the center, it has switched from white to black. So this cannot be spin orbit torque. To check this further, we actually remove the platinum in this ring so that we have current only flowing on the outside of the ring, whereas at the center where we still have nickel oxide platinum, there's no current flowing. And when we inject current pulse, still the center and the outside both switch. So there's no current flowing here, so it really cannot be spin over torque. And the perpendicular current will also switch both the area where the current is flowing, as well as the center where there's no current flowing. So it turns out that this is due to a strain that is generated by a temperature gradient. Where the current is flowing, we have most heating, and therefore we have a temperature gradient. The temperature gradient leads to strain, and this strain is opposite if the current is flowing from left to right or up to down, and therefore it reverses the nail vector from white to black and black to white. So it's not a bug, it's a feature. It actually can also be used for non-contact writing by laser pulses, as I'll show you later, but it's a thermomagnetoelastic switching mechanism. And now you would say, well, is there no spin orbit talks? You always told us about spin orbit talks, but are there none? And there are some hot off the press or hot from the lab results that in some material, which I'm not going to name, uh, you actually can get switching that is both depending on the strain, the current direction and the position dominated by thermomagnetoelastic where the switching is perpendicular to the current and spin orbit torque where the switching is parallel to the current. So if you have a material where you have not so high magnetoelastic coupling and ultra thin layers, you can actually get both thermomagnetoelastic and spin orbit torque switching. Again, if you're the referee of the paper, please be kind. And now finally, I told you that we can also use laser pulses to switch like by thermomagnetoelastic, for instance. Here we have hit the sample with a single femtosecond laser pulse. And we see that before it was uniformly magnetized in this orientation. Here the nail vector. And now after hitting the sample with the laser pulse in the center, we put a little bit too much power. So we actually have a damage of the platinum layer. And on the outside, we generated our domains with 180 degree domain walls, showing that we have reversed the magnetic order. Now, this is nice, and actually all optical switching is established for ferromagnets and ferromagnets, and it was also predicted for antiferromagnets in this paper here, and we just published our work in this paper here, and in particular, we also showed that not only can you write the domains as shown here, but by annealing, you can also get rid of the domains again, so you can actually um, write a multi-domain state, and you can anneal the sample as well to have a single domain state afterwards. The only thing is the center here where we actually destroyed the platinum. So this you have to be a little bit careful, but also to show that this is um, not an effect that is uh, killing the magnetism. We have here a little uh, sc scratch where we have domains which actually stay even after the annealing. So these domains here that we show here, these white lines here are really the ones that are written by the laser and then annealed away again. So it's a reversible process.
Okay, so to sum this up, for the writing, you can use magnetic fields, but you need very high magnetic fields, so not a good idea. You can use strain using a, a medieval torture device or using electrical current, uh, electrical fields with uh, a piezoelectric material. And most interestingly, you can write by currents using the Bagnell staggered spin orbitox, which work very well in manganese to gold and copper manganese arsenide. Interfacial non staggered spin orbitox for insulating antiferromagnets that I just showed to you. There's a strong thermomagnetoelastic switching dominating in thick layers, and there are additional electromigration effects where you have to be careful. There are also thermal gradients due to entropy and quench switching, which I didn't have time to go into. Again, I'm happy to share the slides so you can read up on the literature. Well, and now you tell me, well, Matthias, you've shown us that you can read and write. So why don't you simply um, uh, make a memory device? And well, we did actually not ask, but our colleagues in Prague. So here we actually have a memory device where we have put copper manganese arsenide into an Arduino chip and connected that by USB to our computer. And then we get switching up and down, up and down. So this is a one bit magnetic memory, not super high density, but it works up to 12 Tesla. And I don't know of any magnetic memory that works up to 12 Tesla. And now the last five minutes, I'm also going to show you some new results on long distance spin transport and antiferromagnets. So antiferromagnets are not only interesting because you can read and write, but you can also transport information. So um, what we want to do is the following. We want to use an antiferromagnetic insulator where you can transport spin by magnonic spin currents. So magnonic spin currents are a way to transport spin angular momentum with no charge flowing. And this was pioneered by Bart van Wees in this paper here for ferry magnetic YIG. And also we did some work on this as well. But what we effectively do is you use a platinum wire, a heavy metal layer, whereby the spin hall effect, you generate a spin accumulation at the interface, which then injects a spin current into the uh, magnetic insulator. The spin current then propagates in the magnetic insulator, is then reabsorbed by a second platinum wire, and then by the inverse spin hall effect generates a voltage that can be measured. Now, why should antiferromagnets transport spin angular momentum if they're antiferromagnetic? Well, it turns out that an antiferromagnet can easily transport spin angular momentum if it has easy access and isotropy because it has circularly polarized magnon modes, as shown here. So this mode here um, transports spin angular momentum in that direction. This mode here transports spin angular momentum in that direction. However, in equilibrium, these two modes are degenerate, meaning that there will be the same amount of this mode as this mode. And so the two modes carry opposite spin angular momentum if there's the same number of magnons, the total spin transport will be zero. But what you can do is you can inject a spin current from platinum and thereby you bias your mode. So there's simply more of this mode and less of this mode. So you get net spin current. And so this is something we set out to do. And the material we chose is hematite. Hematite is a below the Morin transition, an easy access antiferromagnet as shown here. And we can actually cut it along different orientations, C plane or R plane to have the nail vector either perpendicular to the plane or roughly in the plane. So the main finding we had, and this was during the time that Romain was with us, is that we can transport spin over tens of micrometers distance. And that is super exciting because if we transport spin over this distance, it's exactly the length scale that companies are interested in. If you have like a processor, you want to transport spin over tens of microns. You don't need to transport it over one meter, but also one nanometer is not enough. So that's exactly the very exciting transport length scale that people are interested in. Also, we checked at the time if this was the predicted spin superfluidity or diffusive transport, and we find there's no threshold current density. It works at low, uh, at relatively uh, high temperatures, and also there's an exponential decay, which you see for large distances, showing that really is diffusive transport, which is good news, because if there's also spin superfluidity, it would actually work to transport over even longer distances. Now, the question is, what is so great about 
um, a hematite. And to do that, we did some low frequency antiferromagnetic mode fMR. And we actually determined the damping from the line width. And we found that the damping is 10 to minus 5 or below 10 to minus 5, which is really the damping, which is the lowest of any antiferromagnet in line with the best ferromagnetic insulator like YIG. So low damping means long transport length scale. And we also identified from the spin pumping the sign handedness, which was as expected here, a right handed mode for the um, hematite. Now, one of the problems always the people from companies said like, look, hematite is great, but if you can only transport spin below the Morin transition, which is 250 Kelvin, it's not going to work at room temperature. So we talked to our colleagues in Israel, and they actually moved the Morin transition by doping to above room temperature so that we can get easy access transport even at room temperature. So we are happy. It turns out that there's also another material, ultram orthoferrite, maybe recently observed um, long distance spin transport also at room temperature, if you're interested, here is the paper. But it gets even better. When we checked whether we can transport spin also in the easy plane phase, we were surprised. In the easy plane phase, we expect that the magnon modes are linearly polarized, so they should not carry spin angular momentum. But it turns out that if you take two linearly polarized magnons and mix them, you can obtain a circular polarized magnon. And that can, the superposition can actually transport spin. And this was found by us and the colleagues at MIT and also in Munich. And by the way, there's a very recent nice paper from Trondheim, from Verena Brehm, where I was also involved, where we explain this by the superposition of these two linearly polarized magnons. Okay, and with that, my time is nearly up. So I've shown you that we can have diffuser spin transport in antiferromagnets. Uh, I did not show you that there's an influence of domains and domain volts on the spin transport, but this is super exciting. And we have low damping in hematite, a really great playground for spin transport. And there's also been a lot of spin transport studies in the vertical direction across antiferromagnetic multilayers, including magnon spin walls. And now finally, one slide on skirmions. Everyone's excited on skirmions. You see behind me, I'm excited about skirmions. So there are actually spin structures that have the topology of antiferromagnetic antiskermions. So if you're interested in this paper here, and also our colleagues here found this, and if you're interested in skermions in general, there's a review that we recently wrote. And then the big question was, are these domain balls chiral? And recently we checked this, and you can actually see, if you look at this domain here, the domain wall all around have all the same color. It's all the same bright white color here. And if you look at the domain wall profile, it's identical everywhere. And that means that the domain walls in this case for nickel oxide on platinum, or platinum on nickel oxide, the domain walls are non-chiral. So they're non-chiral, meaning that there is no chiral spin structure here. So there are no strong lift shift invariants that we actually investigated. If you're interested, the paper will come out also soon. All right, that's it. Now the most important slide. I didn't do any of this work. So this was the group that did the work. In particular, uh, two people that I'd like to point out that started all this work were two excellent postdocs, Romain Lebrun on the spin transport, Lorenzo Badrati on the switching. They've both gone on to do greater things. Romain fortunately stayed in academia. You'll hear him next. Lorenzo all got a, also got a permanent position. And then also Gerd Jakob, Martin Jordan, Hartmut Sabel as our permanent staff scientists and visiting professors. This was the group then during Corona, the group a little bit at the end of Corona, now the group with no more Corona. So um, I'm very grateful to all the people involved. And of course, nothing would work with collaborations. Um, with our theory colleagues in Mainz and Bessie, with uh, people at my second affiliation in Norway, Akash in Madrid, and people in Heimat Dönitz Group in Utrecht, then at uh, Sydney, uh, to Hoko, Leeds, and Stuttgart. And I also got input for a slice from Vincent Balz from Grenoble, as well as Takamoriyama. Um, and colleagues from Kyoto, as well as people in Sendai and Tokyo, where we grew many of the uh, anti ferming insulating films, in particular Rafael Ramos, he's really a wizard on the uh, sputtered position tool. So this was really helpful to get high quality films. Nothing would work without the funding, in particular as Nebula, the joint project, also with the colleagues here in Lille. And so with that, I summarize. 
I've shown you that we can read antiferromagnets. We can use XMLD and Kerr imaging, which is really useful, but not for devices. We can use SMR, AMR, and imprinting into ferromagnets for electrical readout as necessary for devices. Here are the papers. You can write antiferromagnetic insulators and metal uh, by having current injection that generates spin orbit torques and strain, bulk spin orbit torques, but also interfacial spin orbit torques, and also with optics, as shown here. And we can transport spin in antiferromagnetic insulators over long distances. And this can be done primarily in low damping hematite, but most recently also at yttrium orthoferrite. Again, here are the papers. If you are new to the field, then I invite you to have a look at these reviews, which are excellent uh, starting points to the work. And with that, I'd like to thank you if you're interested in the slides. If you have any questions, just send me an email. I'm happy to share the slides. And I thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Uh, can everybody hear the sound? Yes. Can you hear me? I hear you. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay, because I was I just plugged mm -hmm. the microphone. So, uh, yes, so thank you very much for this uh, very impressive uh, overview of uh, the recent works on, the, um, on anti ferromagnetics. Uh, questions in the audience? I, well, Ah, Vasily has one. Uh, thank you very much, Matthias, for this uh, beautiful talk. Uh, you have tried hard uh, to convince us that uh, uh, that getting higher risk frequencies based on novel physical mechanisms will be the future of uh, uh, information technologies, but you did not mention anything about energy efficiency, because mm. so far all your switching seems to be extremely far away from the ultimate Landauer uh, level for the bit switching. Can you mm. comment a little bit about that, how you're going to approach to make your devices energy efficient, please? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So companies like currents, but of course, currents are intrinsically energy inefficient because you are actually generating mostly ohmic losses. Very little of the actual energy use goes into switching. So I think the way forward for low power switching to approach the Landauer limit is using electric fields. So electric fields to generate strain, and by that use the strong thermal magnetoelastic switching is the most likely way that we can get ultimately low power switching. Um, the problem is fast application of electric fields is not so easy, so it's always a trade-off, but I think if you really want to have low power electric fields is the way forward. Thank you, uh, I actually agree with that. And um, and uh, maybe also optics. I mean, that's another thing. Yeah. I uh, you know fundamentally, if you can get this uh, ultra fast switching, um, I think that's also potentially because the laser pulses can be so short. Um, also, not a lot of power in each laser pulse. Of course, you know we saw yesterday from Lucien that now you can even get like these ultra short uh, laser pulses integrated into CMOS devices. So it's actually much closer than I thought. I always thought there was no way you could integrate it. But if you have like really a, like a 50 femtosecond pulse, the power in this pulse is also quite low. Um, well, can you go back to the PMNPT slide because I absolutely have a follow up question. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Here. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we've been working on the same kind of approach, but then, as you said, the, the industrials don't really like lead-based uh, compounds in PM and PT. Yeah. Uh, do you think we could find some some other uh, materials that 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 could achieve the same effect? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe if the magnetoelastic coefficients of of, of uh, antiferromagnets are sufficiently high, maybe we could. Mm -hmm. Do you think we could reach that or? Yeah, I mean, there are, of course, gallium-based materials that are relatively strongly piezoelectric. Um, I don't remember, it's gallium nitride or something. There, there are some semiconductors which also have relatively high um, <clears throat> a piezoelectric coefficients. That's one thing. The other thing we are trying now is to actually use ionic liquid gating, where it's not the strain, but it's a direct electric field that changes the properties. Mm -hmm. 
that also seems to work. Whether that is closer to applications is a bit <laughs> it's not easy. Uh, <clears throat> but I think, um, I mean, I think in the piezo materials, there's a lot of research going on, going away from PZT, PNMPT, and so on. So we just use it because it's convenient, but it's very clear that no uh, company will actually make a device based on lead-based, expensive and uh, hard to control piezoelectric materials. Uh, but I think in the literature, if you look around, there are a lot of piezoelectric materials now, which have uh, a little bit lower piezoelectric constants, but are much more compatible with potential CMOS integration. So I think that not, not all is lost, but I think electric fields can go beyond strain. As I said, ionic liquid gating is another thing we're trying where we don't have something published yet, but which is potentially also quite interesting. Martino has a question also. Yeah, maybe I have a question or I missed something. But when you see that the switching is a thermomechanomagnetic switching mm -hmm. uh, and not a spin torque switching, yeah, uh, well, I, I would expect uh, that the main difference will be uh, that uh, the thermomechanic switching must be slow. I mean, to thermalize something. Uh, <laughs> I expect to have another scale of time of yeah. the process. Yeah, yeah. It, it turns out, um, yes, it's slow, but it can be triggered by a very short pulse. So one 100 femtosecond laser pulse is enough. The mechanism itself might take, you know, a nanosecond or so, but you can just trigger it with a single 100 femtosecond laser pulse. So unless you want to switch the same bit back and forth within a nanosecond, it's not a problem. You trigger it with 100 femtosecond and then it switches. And in the meantime, you do something else. So yes, the mechanism is not super fast, uh, but the um, uh, generated um, excitation that you need to trigger the switching can be very fast. Thank you. I don't see any other questions. So thank you again. We can no, okay can great that. thank yeah. you very much matt yes no problem thanks and, everyone and uh, again if you want to have the slides just send me a quick email and i'm very happy to to share the slides and uh, yeah wishing you a great conference i'm also looking forward to the next talk thanks <laughs>